Thank you, Jonathan. And thanks for moderating. The, the moderators have just been excellent throughout the whole conference. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Cable Green. I'm the director of open education at Creative Commons. I see some familiar faces here in the room. Uh, uh, first, before we get started, if everybody could just introduce themselves in the chat, uh, that would be great. Maybe uh, your name, uh, where you work, and where you are. And I am in Olympia, Washington today at my home. And I was telling uh, Jonathan, I'm, uh, I and all of the other Pacific Northwesters in the United States are happy today because it's not raining. And at this time of the year, it usually is raining. So it's a good day. We've got somebody from Kansas. All right, Natasha's in India. Welcome, Natasha. Where's everybody else from? All right, at uh, North Charleston, South, South Carolina. Welcome, Jessica. Excellent. Well, as people come in, go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, there they come. We got Canada, Brazil, Colorado Springs. That's where Jonathan is. It's one of my favorite places. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. Uh, let me say right up front, I will be sharing these slides with you right at the end of the presentation. Uh, so you don't have don't don't need to take notes. Don't need to take screenshots. Uh, I'll make uh, I'll give you a link, and these will all be available. I am going to go ahead and share my screen and ask Jonathan, can you see the slides? We're good to go. All right, I see a thumbs up. Fabulous. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about the UNESCO recommendation on OER and specifically what can we all do as open education advocates uh, and people who work in open education to create the resources and the support services and the advocacy uh, and the discussions around this recommendation with our national governments, with our state and provincial governments, and with our education institutions. So that's what this session is about today. Uh, my information is at the bottom of this uh, slide. If you'd like to talk more about this topic, I'd love to speak with you. Uh, my email is there. I'm cable at creativecommons.org. And you can also uh, catch me on Twitter at cgreen, C-G-R-E-E-N. Okay, uh, all these slides, uh, unless otherwise noted, are under a Creative Commons attribution license. So feel free to reuse them. Uh, as you see fit. Uh, so a couple, a uh, bit of context here. Creative Commons is now 20 years old. We're actually having our 20th anniversary this year. Uh, and we've been working on open education for that entire 20 years. Uh, I've been at CC for just over 10 years uh, and we've always been in the open education space and will continue to do so. Uh, during that 20 years, we've worked with uh, many others also working in open education. Um, today, we're going to focus a little bit on uh, UNESCO. And so we've worked with UNESCO and OECD and other IGOs and national governments and lots and lots of civil society organizations or NGOs around the world for this full 20 years. UNESCO is, many of you uh, have probably heard of UNESCO, know of UNESCO. UNESCO is one of the wings of the United Nations. And UNESCO specifically is the, the part of the UN that focuses on education, science, and culture. And so when, uh, when the United Nations gets involved in conversations around open education, it's led by UNESCO. Another thing to know about UNESCO is that they have these uh, various legal instruments um, that countries around the world, the UNESCO members or national governments from around the planet, uh, and they come together and they talk about uh, the big issues uh, that affect not just their individual countries, but the world. Uh, and then UNESCO has these various legal instruments to, to formalize uh, the, the wants and desires and the commitments of these countries. And so they have things called conventions uh, that are at the highest level. And so like the Convention on Human Rights would be uh, the highest level of, of, uh, recommend, of uh, what UNESCO is talking with national governments about and then commitments that national governments are making. On the, on the low end are something called uh, declarations. 
declarations are more, uh, here's, a, here's a topic that's really important, something that we should start to pay attention to. Uh, so in 2012, UNESCO actually um, passed what's called the UNESCO Declaration on OER. In the middle uh, are something called recommendations. And I've got the detailed uh, <laughs> script here from UNESCO, but recommendations are legal instruments, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the very bottom in bold, um, these recommendations are intended to influence the development of national laws and practices. So recommendations are a really big deal. Um, they are discussed and debated and written usually over a couple of years. Uh, lots of meetings happen around uh, the, the lead up to passing a recommendation. Uh, and these recommendations are uh, exactly what it says here. They're intended for a national government that's a UNESCO member to say, okay, this is a serious topic. What national laws do I need to change? What policies do I need to put in place? Uh, what practices in my country do I need to support? So these recommendations are a big deal. In 2019, there was uh, the 40th UNESCO General Conference, and one of the items on the agenda uh, that was voted on was a UNESCO recommendation on open educational resources. Uh, it was unanimously adopted. All countries voted yes by the 193 UNESCO member states. Uh, and Jonathan, would you please share uh, in, the, uh, in the chat the link to the UNESCO recommendation? So everybody's got that, thanks. And so this is now uh, of an official recommendation. It's been adopted by uh, countries around the world. Uh, for those of you in the United States, just a quick addendum here. Uh, the United States is one of the very few countries in the world that is not a formal UNESCO member. Um, so long story, if you wanna learn more about it, you can, you can Google why that is, I'm or I'm happy to describe it, uh, but they're not an official member. That said, the United States did actively participate in the conversations and the, the editing and the meetings around the, the lead up to the recommendation. And so they were very involved in this. They just didn't have an official vote because they're not an official uh, member of UNESCO at this time. Uh, I say that because um, there's still an opportunity for the United, United States to fully participate in the implementation of the recommendation, just like every other country. Uh, the recommendation, uh, as we said before, this is a, um, I'm gonna say a little bit more about it here. It's a specific UNESCO instrument uh, that gives national governments a list of recommendations and a list of actions for them in this case, because this is a recommendation on OER to support open education in their countries. And then it actually calls out and says, don't just do this alone. Uh, you should be working with other countries uh, as you implement this. And that's true of, of all recommendations. This particular recommendation on OER has five major areas. So if you look at the document that Jonathan sent you, uh, you'll see that the recommendation is, uh, has these five major sections in it. Uh, the first one is building the capacity of stakeholders to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER. So this is all about capacity building, uh, professional learning opportunities, uh, getting certified, uh, having uh, you know, various trainings, having uh, conferences where you can bring together a lot of people in your country to learn about open education and why it's important. So it's that, uh, that awareness raising and then skilling up of lots of people in country. The next area is developing supportive policy for OER. So this is everything from, uh, from funders, including governments, uh, putting uh, open licensing policies in place where they say, you know, whatever's publicly funded is, uh, has a Creative Commons license on it. That's quite common. We call those open license requirements. Uh, foundations and institutes and others uh, oftentimes adopt those. But it's also things like uh, we're going to have a policy to regularly provide funding for universities. Uh, we might have a, a policy to support faculty with release time who want to uh, work on uh, converting a course to OER, converting a whole degree program to a, to a zero textbook cost degree. Uh, it might be a supportive policy uh, to, uh, to adjust the rules around promotion and tenure. So that when some when a faculty member or an educator goes for promotion or tenure, that they're uh, if they're publishing in open access journals uh, and or if they are 
uh, contributing OER to the commons, that that's viewed as a positive thing and you get more points in your promotion and tenure. So there's lots and lots of different types of policy that the recommendation uh, calls out that we should look at. The third area is include, uh, encouraging inclusive and equitable quality OER. Um, this really goes right at the conversation of what type of, what kind of content are we building for whom, uh, who, gets, uh, who gets to be involved in creating that content? Um, are we truly being inclusive and equitable uh, as we're creating educational resources and then openly licensing, licensing them? Uh, so this one's you know, absolutely critical. And you've seen at this conference, uh, many examples of some really great work happening in this area. Uh, the fourth area is nurturing and creation of sustainability models for OER. Uh, and this really goes at the, um, uh, primarily at the business models, at the flows of money, uh, how policy might interact with this, um, what the commercial sector might have to say about this, uh, and what the public institutions that are that support education, uh, new ways of them thinking about how they can ensure that when they use public funds, uh, that the resources that they procure or produce or commission are open. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then the last area is to promote and reinforce international cooperation. So there's no need for any country or any state or province or any education institution to do this alone. Uh, the recommendation has a very detailed set of actions, and we can all work on those actions together. And so that, in a nutshell, are the broad areas of the recommendation. Within each one of these categories, you'll see a lot of detail and specific subcategories and actions that governments and others uh, can take to implement the recommendation. So I want to emphasize how important this is. This is a real milestone in open education. Uh, open education as a field is really only 20 years old, uh, maybe a little bit older, depending on who you're talking to. Um, but that's not a long time when it comes to uh, politics or laws or uh, the focus of, in this case, the world's nations. And so this is a um, this is a milestone. This is something to be celebrated and. Uh, most important, in my opinion, this is a unique opportunity to advance open education uh, for all the reasons that we work in it globally. Um, and so um, some other points here, when we're working with national governments or provincial or state governments, it's an opportunity to have scaled impact. Uh, it's one thing for me to work with my community college or university uh, to have, you know, promotion and tenure policies that favor the production and use and adoption of, of open education. Um, it's a whole nother deal when the Ministry of Education in Belize says, uh, from now on, uh, everything that we fund and procure for educational resources will be openly licensed. It's just a different level of scale. Uh, and we can, um, with this instrument, with this recommendation, we can have new conversations with governments because the governments have signed on to this thing. The governments built this thing uh, that we couldn't have before. And so that's, uh, that's very exciting. Um, those of you who know me or have heard me speak in the past know that uh, I'm very keen on thinking about uh, public funding and how what the rules are on public funding of educational resources, of research uh, in science, et cetera. And this is, uh, this is my firm belief that publicly funded resources should be openly licensed. When the public pays for something, the public should have access to what it paid for. Uh, and we shouldn't restrict those resources just to one country. If the public in one country paid for something, yes, they should all have access. And there's no reason not to let the rest of the world have access as well. Um, one of the new ideas, uh, so you know, this is an older idea. We've been working on this for a long time. This is, should not be new to anybody. Um, this is an idea that, um, that I started to put forth maybe you know, four or five years ago. And whereas open policy is very uh, top down, so it's you know the funder could be a foundation or a government saying if you take this money, uh, what you produce in your grant or your contract will be openly licensed. That's that's an open policy usually. Whereas open procurement is really bottom up. So open procurement might be uh, a school district buying educational resources, or it might be a university's. Uh, math department that maybe Jonathan works in and that math department saying, 
uh, okay, for uh, entry level pre calculus textbooks and educational resources, let's have a conversation as a faculty and decide what we are going to use. So, uh, what are we going to assign our students? And so, the idea of open procurement is at the point that you still control the money. So, if you're a if you're a school district in primary or secondary schools, um, your district has money, and you're going to procure or buy educational resources for your students. What open procurement says is don't do the traditional thing, which is I'm going to give a bunch of money to the to the market, probably to a for profit publisher. Um, they're going to sell me educational resources uh, at a high price. And the model used to be that I got paper and then I kept that paper for 10, 12 years and amortized the cost over that long period of time. Uh, and then I bought new resources. Well, that was problematic because resources got old and stale and students couldn't keep the resources and the books ripped and you couldn't update them and it was a bit of a mess. The new model that publishers are putting out is a digital lease. So now you don't even own what you buy. You lease digital access to the resource for, a, for the duration of your lease. And then when you stop paying, you lose access, which is also bad, right? This is not what we should be doing with digital resources. Open procurement says if you are procuring, if you're buying resources, that's fine. Build, buy, commission, you know, pay money for what you need. If you can build it in house, even better. Uh, but it's okay to have somebody else build it for you or buy what they have. But number two, ensure that when you procure or buy something, that you own what you buy. Right. So I don't like I don't lease cars. I go buy a car and then I own it. And because I own my car, I can sell it or I can loan it to somebody or I can let my kid drive it when they get their license. There's all, I have all these things I can do with it. So if you're going to buy or commission uh, copyrighted resources, make sure you, the public education institution, owns the copyright to what you buy. And then hopefully you'll have an internal open policy that says you're going to share and CC license what you own. And so, you know, I. I'm trying to put this in a catchy phrase, you know, <laughs> build or buy what you need, own what you buy and share what you own. And that's the idea of open procurement. I bring this up because we wove this into the recommendation and suggested that uh, that that uh, countries and education institutions and districts of schools and primary and secondary schools take a good hard look at how they spend their public money and ask themselves, is there more, a more effective, efficient way of procuring and owning and sharing educational resources that is not beholden to the market forces, which are taking us down a path that are not very helpful. Okay, so that's a lot about the recommendation. Um, now, what's, what's happening? Like, who's working on this? Uh, is anybody taking advantage uh, of this milestone and starting to put together some help for governments? Uh, and the answer is yes, and we're just getting started. There's a long way to go. So there are uh, at least three uh, collaboratives that Creative Commons works with, uh, and not just us, many other organizations are part of these as well. Um, the first one is the UNESCO OER Dynamic Coalition. So Jonathan, if you could share that link, that would be great. Um, this is a group that's led by UNESCO and specifically led by the UNESCO staff, which, uh, which facilitated the whole creation and passing of the recommendation. And so this is a really important group. Um, what they've done uh, so far is they've uh, hosted webinars with experts from all around the world on the different areas of the recommendation. Uh, and there's a lot of sharing of ideas going on and challenges and how we can collectively overcome those challenges. Uh, and so that's one group. The second group uh, we call the Network of Open NGOs. This is uh, uh, lots of different uh, non-governmental organizations or civil society organizations that work in the open education space uh, who have gotten together and said, look, all of us were going to do something to support governments and, and education institutions around the recommendation. Why don't we work together? Um, why don't we coordinate our efforts? Why don't we pool uh, our resources so that we can, uh, we can have a, a more united uh, set of services uh, and uh, and communicate, uh, you know, hopefully with uh, with one voice to governments that we're working with, and so this is a great group. They meet once a month. Um, it's uh, facilitated by uh, by OE Global. They do a great job pulling us all together and keeping us on track. 
uh, and uh, and OER Africa um, uh, group uh, or OER Africa and Neil Butcher and Associates is part of that, and they're leading us right now uh, in a in a effort to build case studies. So we're talking about short one to two pager case studies that are easily digestible by government officials to demonstrate the success of OER. So all of us have you know ideas and uh, philosophies about why. Uh, open education is good, and we've got anecdotes, and we've got data from oftentimes our own countries or our own institutions, uh, and that's great. And governments, you talk to them about that stuff, and they say, show me the data. And so we're putting together research-backed case studies uh, of various OER successes from all around the world. Uh, what we found with this group was we had a lot of ideas, but what we really needed to do was to stop, pick something, focus, and do that one thing, and then we're going to move on to the to the next thing. And so that's uh, that's coming along nicely. Uh, the third group is a group that um, that I facilitate. It's called the Creative Commons Open Education Platform. Uh, think of this as a working group uh, for open education topics that are global in nature. Uh, so this is a big group. We've got uh, over 1,100 people from 94 countries, and it's growing all the time. Um, you're all welcome to join this. It is free to join. Um, Jonathan, could you drop those three links in for me, please? Uh, the first link uh, Jonathan will share is a link to the Open Education uh, Platform's webpage on the CC website. Uh, there's information about how to join. If you have any problem joining, just send me an email and I will add you to the list. Um, we meet every few months. We also have a Slack channel and various forms of communication. Um, the next link Jonathan will share is our 2021 work plan in the platform. And the reason that I wanna share that is that one of the areas of work that the platform members decided that they wanted to work on was helping governments implement the UNESCO recommendation on OER. So you'll see some more detail in there. And then the third link that Jonathan will share um, is a grid that we're gonna use in just a minute. Uh, we're gonna have an, uh, some interactivity uh, and work together. But these are possible actions to, um, to operationalize or help governments implement the recommendation on OER. And so this, uh, this grid, this uh, multi-column thing that Jonathan's sharing, uh, the column on the far left is the recommendation. So that's actually the copy and paste text right out of the recommendation. The next column over is uh, what can uh, governments do? I think that's what it is. I don't have it in front of me but it's what could governments do? So what are the specific actions that we think governments can take that fulfill those parts of the recommendation? And then the other column is what can institutions do? And here we're talking about education institutions, uh, universities, colleges, schools, and other formal uh, education institutions. We're gonna come back to that document in just a moment. Uh, so as I said, please uh, feel free to sign up and join the CC Open Ed platform. We'd love to have you. It is open. It's free. Uh, all are welcome to join. Okay, uh, so now we're going to come back to that last doc, that three-column document that Jonathan shared. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is I'm going to stop talking. Uh, we're going to open it up for uh, questions first, uh, and then we're going to engage in this uh, activity together for the remaining time. Uh, and that is um, what I'd like to do is have us all think about how can we uh, work in our countries with our governments, either at a national level or at a state or provincial level, uh, and or your education institutions that you work with, how can we help them implement parts of the UNESCO recommendation on OER? Uh, when you look at the recommendation, it is huge. There's a lot of stuff to do in there. We can't do it all at once with any government or any institution, and they may never implement the entire thing, and that's okay. The question that we're asking at this early stage of implementation is, what can we start with? What's a natural fit for your institution or for your government? Where is their opportunity? Uh, what skills do you have? What connections do you have? Uh, that you might be able to help your government or your education institution make some progress on implementing parts of the recommendation. Um, and or what might you produce? So as you can see in these groups, what we're starting to do is to produce resources that advocates will need as they're engaged in these support services. So these case studies that we're building with the network of open NGOs, those are going to be licensed CC BY, and we're going to share them, publish them 
uh, openly, and anybody in the world can take those, translate them, modify them, and use them in their advocacy efforts. And we're going to be we're going to keep building in these groups more and more of those openly licensed assets that advocates can use. So that's another area where you, as individuals, or you as groups of open education leaders, uh, can contribute as well. And so, uh, so I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment. Actually, let me just share my contact information here again, cable at creativecommons.org or at C Green on Twitter. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and then we're going to come back to this document in just a minute. There we go. And so at this point, um, Jonathan, were there any questions along the way that we should circle back to in the chat that people have already asked? I think there's only one. Um, Jody Bailey asks, um, says, I subscribe to the CC Open EDU email list. Does that mean I'm already a member of the CC Open Education platform? Yes, that is the email list. Okay. Uh, so if uh, at this point, there's really three ways that people can, uh, can, can chime in. One is uh, feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your video and and ask your question or just suggest how you might uh, brainstorm or how you might contribute uh, and, and or how you might help your government or your education institution. Uh, if you've got an idea, please share it. Um, if you have a question about how to do it, let's talk about it. Um, alternatively, if you, uh, you can also chat in the chat window and I'll keep an eye on that. Uh, and we can also use this Google document. Everybody has comment permissions for it. And feel free to look through it and add comments about where you think you might be able to contribute. So I'll stop talking. The floor is open. Uh, go ahead and uh, you feel free if anybody wants to ask a question or talk about how you might contribute, just unmute yourself and turn your video on if you'd like. Hi, uh, my name is Elena McNabb and um, I work at the College of DuPage um, as an adjunct faculty uh, manager. Um, so I'm looking at this list and I'm seeing a couple things just because I specifically work with adjunct faculty here at our institution. And since the, our institution is a community college, it's um, a lot of our resources end up being public anyways. Um, so I'm just thinking about how like our library can incorporate um, OER and I guess advertise it to the community, but then also just some things that I can do within my own department would be to organize a workshop, which we do, but make it focused on OER. But then also I like the idea of installing OER awards, um, which is a great incentive for faculty. Um, and we can eventually you know, we can start with adjunct faculty and move it to full time um, and incorporate those two groups. But yeah, I thought that was a really great opportunity um, to develop that within my own department. Those are all really great ideas. And thanks, Elena, for, for sharing. Um, if you look at the first section of the recommendation, right, it's all about building capacity, building awareness. There's a ton of good ideas in there for, uh, you know, for an institution that's maybe just getting started or you're in the early stages of building. And everything that you, uh, you know, talked about is, you know, I think fits squarely in that first area. And so I would say yes to everything you said. And, you, you know, you might see some other things in this first section um, that might be useful as you're looking to build the, the capacity and the skills uh, at your institution. Um, another quick plug that I'll make um, is that uh, Creative Commons uh, also has something called the CC Certificate, uh, which is a 10-week online course. Uh, we also do it as a one-week boot camp, and it's an opportunity for people to uh, really learn at a deep level about copyright, the public domain, CC licenses, uh, open education, a bit of advocacy, uh, more and more about open pedagogy we're weaving into the curriculum. Uh, and so if that's something uh, that's of interest, uh, Jonathan, maybe you could drop the link in for the certificate page. That'd be great. Um, we also just, um, there's a, there, there is a fee to that. The, it's a $500 course fee for the 10 week course. These are facilitated. Jonathan's actually one of our long term, uh, long time facilitators. Um, these are um, 
uh, really great courses. People uh, love taking them. They um, th thanks, Jonathan, for putting the link in. We also just uh, struck uh, a deal with the regional compacts in the United States to provide a 15% discount off that price, uh, which is new. And so if your institution is a member of SREB or WICHE or NEBI or any of the regional compacts, which it probably is, um, then uh, it's not $500, it's whatever, $485 it's with that discount. But that's another, I bring it up, Elena, because that's another way to build capacity at your institution is you might want to get two or three people uh, CC certified at your institution. And then you've got some uh, some real experts in open licensing who can serve as resources to other faculty and instructional designers, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's great. And I can already think of a couple of people that I can plug in there to see if they'd be want, willing to do that. So yeah, thank you. That's great. Uh, oh, I see a question here. Um, has there been any pushback against the recommendation at any stage? Uh, maybe from commercial publishers, or do you anticipate future pushback? Um, yeah, there was a lot of pushback at every stage, and there, uh, and then what's happening right now is different than pushback, but I'll describe it. Um, so yes, when the recommendation was being worked on, and, and by the way, uh, UNESCO is on track to pass a recommendation on open science this November at the next general conference, which is awesome. And we hope in the future, that UNESCO will uh, have a recommendation on open culture, which is kind of its third area that it focuses on. And so we'll be uh, uh, nudging, suggesting, helping UNESCO uh, head that direction as well, because open glam or galleries, libraries, archives, and museums is another space that Creative Commons uh, works in. We've got a program around that as well. Um, so to answer uh, Jonathan's question, did we have pushback? Uh, yeah, there was. There, were, there was pushback from, um, there's pushback from publishers who don't like, you know, rarely like discussion about open education, full stop, <laughs> because, uh, you know, the creation adoption of open educational resources usually means uh, less market share for, for them to sell expensive, all rights reserved, copyrighted materials. Um, and so, you know, they don't like that and they raise their voice. Uh, we also had, um, you know, there was, uh, I would say, uh, quite a bit of lack of awareness and understanding by several countries around the world as the recommendation was being debated. And so um, and you, I'm sure you've all encountered this as well as you've had conversations about copyright and open licensing and, and OER with, with uh, people that you've worked with. Um, you know, sometimes people think mistakenly that when you put an open license on something that you're actually losing your copyright or you're giving up your copyright. And we know that's not the case, right? You're, the beauty of CC licensing is you keep your copyright and you're adding a license for the public that provides some, uh, some rights and some permissions, uh, but the author still retains uh, her or his copyright. And so um, there was that confusion. And so there had to be some education of those uh, representatives along the way. Um, there was of course debate about the specific language um, Countries, uh, when it comes to the, these UNESCO instruments, countries, of course, like to have uh, you know, full authority to make decisions in their countries about their countries. And they're always very careful about ceding any authority to uh, outside entities, including international governmental organizations like UNESCO. And so, um, you know, there was a big debate about whether or not countries would be required to do these things, or if countries would be uh, even required to report every few years about the progress they were making against the recommendation. And so you'll see language in it, which is uh, maybe a little bit softer than some of us uh, would have liked, uh, where it's encouraging countries to do these things, and it's recommending that countries uh, report publicly on their progress. Uh, but honestly, that's the way of international agreements, right? Yeah, you, there's a lot of compromise uh, to get these things across the line and to get them passed. Um, and those, those compromises have to be made. Um, and that's, uh, that's not abnormal at all. All international, big international agreements uh, encounter that kind of discussion and debate. And I, and I believe that to be a healthy thing. That's, that's the way diplomacy works. Um, what's happening now is different. So this thing is now passed. Um, 
And uh, of course, it passed in late 2019. And we all know that shortly thereafter, we were all blessed with a global pandemic. Uh, and so, as you might imagine, uh, national governments around the world are a bit distracted at the moment. Uh, and as you imagine, and then as a whole, and then if you look at their ministries of education or their national departments of education, um, they are also very focused on a specific set of challenges, right? So as schools closed, there was this massive move to online learning. And in many countries, including the United States and Canada, where most of the conference participants are from, uh, you know, there were a lot of teachers and a lot of both in uh, primary and secondary education, but also in tertiary or university education that were not well prepared for that. There were a lot of universities and schools that did not have the technology in place. And there was, you know, uh, if you watched Zoom's stock, right, that we're using right now, Zoom stock went way up because there was a massive purchasing of that and other technologies to go online. And so that uh, that grabbed the attention, as you might imagine, of ministries of education around the world. Um, there's also um, a lot of concern right now and a lot of effort uh, looking at uh, kids that, and I'll say kids, I've got two kids who are in primary and secondary school, who, uh, when their schools closed, they went home. Uh, many, in many, many countries around the world, they do not have good internet access, or in many cases, even uh, stable electricity. They certainly don't have one-to-one -one laptop programs uh, in many countries. And so uh, closing school didn't mean moving online. Closing school meant closing school. Like I don't go to school anymore. And so that was a known factor. We knew that was going to happen. The problem is, is that as schools are reopening, a lot of those students don't come back. Right? They've been put into uh, labor situations where they're now working and helping to support their families because COVID took a hit or the parents took a hit in their uh, employment and their ability to earn a living. And so there's just lots of challenges and problems right now uh, in the education space globally that are, are drawing the attention. And so, as you might imagine, things like the UNESCO recommendation on OER, which is uh, it's not mandatory. This is a you know an optional thing that governments have signed on to, um, that they've lost focus a little bit on that, uh, and rightfully so. Right, we got to make sure that students can safely get back into school. Um, it, uh, th those those take priority. Um, that being said, uh, there is also so that's the that's the down major downside for education around the pandemic. We you know we hope that that will get better. Uh, as vaccines continue to spread, uh, as uh, in, in the United States anyway, they're about to approve vaccines for five to 12 year olds, I believe that's coming in the coming days. Um, but that's, we all know that globally, we've got a real problem with vaccines. It's incredibly inequitable what's happening in terms of vaccine distribution. Uh, I think of all the vaccines given in the world, uh, most of the countries in Africa have, you know, have received something like 2% as compared uh, of their population have been vaccinated as compared to many countries in the global north, which are you know, 60, 70, 80%. And so massive inequity problems there that affect students in education that are gonna have to be worked out. The silver lining, which is interesting, if you saw, there was a presentation at this conference about, um, uh, about um, what's his name, uh, Bayview Analytics uh, that does surveys every year about OER, they asked the question, just looking at the United States, uh, what happened in terms of uh, the adoption and use of open education resources uh, when courses went massively online? Uh, and the answer was not a lot, like we didn't get a big bump in OER, uh, but to be determined. Uh, and so they're kind of keeping an eye on it. And so, um, uh, thanks Jonathan, gave me the one minute warning. Um, so that'll be interesting to watch, uh, but that is an opportunity for we advocates that work in open education, uh, that as, uh, as schools engage more and more in digital because they have to go online or they're having more hybrid, uh, that that is an opportunity uh, to talk about OER, raise awareness, and help them adopt uh, open educational resources instead of all rights reserved expensive commercial resources, which they probably have to lease and not own. Um, and so let me, I'll, I'll stop there and um, uh, I'll take my last 20 seconds and say two things. One is, if you'd like to talk more, feel free to reach out to me anytime.
I'm happy to connect you with these uh, groups. I'm happy to work with you if you've got ideas. Uh, second, if you uh, want to add ideas directly to this document, you've got comment level access, feel free to throw your ideas on here uh, and our questions and I'll review those and reach out to you. Uh, and then last, if anybody does want to stay after this, Jonathan's going to close the recording, but if anybody wants to stay and talk for a minute, I'm happy to do so. Back to you, Jonathan. Yes, thank you so much. We, um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,